Good afternoon, Mrs. Jovana Marovic. You are the executive director of this excellent think tank, the Politicon Network in Montenegro. So Montenegro has a population of roughly uh, 623,000 uh, people. And out of this uh, figure, we have a relatively important number of uh, victims of the COVID-19, if we take into account 367 cases and nine people who died, actually. So at the start of the outbreak, there was a feeling that the crisis uh, was well managed by the authorities. But then, if we rely on the inputs provided by some uh, NGOs, human rights NGOs, or even the Reporters uh, Without Borders Yearly Freedom Index, which was released during the, during the pandemic, uh, it seems that lack of transparency on the side of the government, some breach, breaches of human rights, violation of privacy, or spread of fake news have occurred. So could you tell us more about the, this allegation related to the public management of the crisis, including perhaps the state of play of the media during this period? Yes, thank you for inviting me to be part of this um, interview or uh, video. Uh, in Montenegro, and Montenegro is uh, for some time stagnating and or even backsliding regarding all aspects uh, when it comes to democracy and state of democracy in the country. And the latest Freedom House reports, report from April, actually, uh, the, Montenegro is no longer semi-consolidated democracy, but the hybrid regime. And that's something which clearly shows what is the state of democracy in the country. So when it comes to non-democratic practices in Montenegro, they are deeply rooted in the political system because we have the same government and same party in power from uh, for 30 years now. Um, and when it comes to epidemic, yes, as you well said, it was um, well managed by the, by the government and by this national coordination body. And there was huge support for such measures and everything. No state of emergency was introduced in the country, but the measures were really strict, but mainly in accordance with the law and with the criminal code. And that, that's why there was huge support for such measures and for, for such moves and actions uh, from the government. But just, uh, let's say, four days after the first uh, um, cases of the coronavirus were uh, registered and recorded, uh, the government uh, decided to publish the name of people which were ordered to be in self-isolation, which was a violation of the Constitution, violation of the law on personal data protection, violation of the law on uh, health care, and also the Article 8 of the European uh, Convention um, of the Human Rights. So that's why the first wave of the dis dissatisfaction started in the country. Then the second thing is that there wasn't a clear and proper system of the check and balances, which even does not work properly in the regular circumstances. And during the crisis and the epidemic, uh, the parliament, the role of the parliament was completely marginalized. The parliament was not active. The, the first session was um, end of the April. And as I said, the first case of the coronavirus were, was recorded on uh, 17 March. So uh, the government actually involved the parliament in the last stage of the, of the crisis because our the, the the numbers of the of the uh, cases which were infected uh, by coronavirus were were really low. For example, you already said that now the the, the number is higher, but uh, by the end of May, number of infected was 326, and number of deaths was uh, nine. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why the government was trusted during that period. But after this decision to publish the, the names of the people in self-isolation mm -hmm. and after the almost regarding the parliament and then adoption of some, some really problematic solutions, there was uh, the, the, the wave of the, the dissatisfaction in the country. So uh, during that session in the uh, end of April, the parliament adopted uh, changes to the law on um, law, uh, political party financing, uh, and uh, by, uh, with these solutions, uh, the, the, the government, actually the parliament and the state allowed it to, be, to, to pay and to allocate social benefits during the election year, because 
um, the, the reasoning was and justification uh, in order to mitigate the risks and uh, what happened during the crisis. That's mm -hmm. the first thing which was problematic. The second thing is uh, the change of the law on, so of, on uh, local self-government where uh, now um, the mandate of the local parliaments can be extended during the crisis and the epidemic. That's two cases which are really, really problematic and where the government actually used the crisis to push some really problematic solutions. Mm -hmm. And then um, when it comes to media, you know, the, the, this uh, trend of, of arrests because of the fake news, because of the panic spreading, panic, panic and everything started even in January and February. And it was continued during the, 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 the crisis. And that's something which is also really uh, problematic in terms of, um, let's say, respecting the, the, the rights and, and freedoms uh, in, in the country. So that's just few cases. I, I, I mean that the, the main conclusion is that actually the government did everything which is usually doing in the country. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So now the second question. Uh, since December, the draft law on religion uh, freedom has triggered massive protests with the leadership of the Serbian Orthodox Church. Uh, despite, despite the restriction of uh, movement and the lockdown due to the COVID-19, some priests and monks have challenged the sanitary measures. Now, since mid-June, thousands of people went back to the street against the draft law. And the president, Djukanovic, a month ago, approximately, said that the Serbian Orthodox Church would like to run the country. So, because we are ignorant about that, could you explain us what is at stake ex exactly with this contested law? It's actually not a dra draft law, it's law now. It, it, it was adopted in the, in the parliament in December, and then the protests started, which were organized and which are organized by the Serbian Orthodox Church. Um, there, there are a few uh, really controversies regarding this law and the, the few articles in, in that law on freedom of religion um, are interpreted by the supporters of the Serbian Orthodox Church, by the part of the opposition, but even um, by the part of the civil society in the country as an attempt of the government to grab a, a property of the Serbian Orthodox Church. Uh, this church is controlling... Now, there is uh, uh, some data from, from um, some newspapers that uh, the Serbian Orthodox Church is controlling over 700 churches and mon monasteries and the other property in the country. And that's why this is really a huge issue in, in the country. So that's the interpretation from the one side and this, the other side. Um, there is lack of, of proper um, justification of such move because the, the, the law was adopted over the night, actually in the midnight, you know, just a few days before the new year, and then without any kind of, of let's say, compromise between two sides. As I said, this is really, really a big issue for such a small country where, where a Serbian Orthodox Church has many supporters. So that's why there are protests in Montenegro. They, there were some, let's say, violation of the measures that the public gatherings gatherings are were banned during the, the crisis and during that public gathering in Nikšić on 12th, uh, 12th May um, as you said uh, bishop and and some members of the Serbian Orthodox Church were, were arrested but uh, the government uh, police did not arrest it did not arrest the um, let's say uh, people which celebrated the Independence Day on 21st May. So there was selective application of the measures even during the coronavirus crisis. So it's a really complicated issue. And even now, you know, protests are ongoing. And there is also tensions between two sides in the country because the, this measure that just 200 people can be at the same place at the same time is still, you know, um, in place. And uh, again, we have high number of, of uh, infected people in the country. So somehow it's really, really uh, challenging to, to, to control such situation. And last but not least, uh, on its path, uh, on this path toward uh, the integration into the EU, Montenegro has been negotiating the acquis communautaire chapters uh, since uh, 2012. 
But so far, it has closed only three out of the open 32, if I'm not wrong. Meanwhile, and after a difficult debate among the EU member states, a new methodology of the European Commission with the Western Balkans, the six Western Balkans candidates, has been adopted in March, so during the time of the pandemic. How was the decision perceived in Montenegro? Would you assess positively this new approach, uh, taking into account that during the last years be justified or not? Montenegro was considered as a so-called front-runner together with Serbia in comparison with the other candidates who joined the EU. I think that Montenegro will still be front runner with new methodology or without new methodology, just because Montenegro really fulfilled many of criteria uh, to open these two, 32 chapters. Um, I think that the, this acceptance of the new and revised methodology by the European Commission now has just symbolic character. Uh, the government wanted to send a message that, that it is ready to negotiate under the strict new conditions. And I think that there are really good principles in that new revised methodology. But the, the good principles were, were even in the strategy, you know, from two years ago. Uh, but the strategy is, uh, you know, it's like that letter. So on the paper, so now, uh, you know, we still don't know what will be with the methodology in practice. Uh, I see methodology, as I said, as a good one, uh, because there is uh, some um, initiative to have the proper system of sanctioning or rewarding system, a uh, rewarding system in accordance with the uh, progress in accordance with the results in the rule of law. And I think that the basic and the, the, the most important question regarding Montenegrin, uh, case of the Montenegro, is how the European Commission will evaluate the progress achieved so far. So in my opinion, um, Montenegro should open all six clusters at once, you know, because we, uh, as I said, opened so far 32 chapters, but uh, um, it doesn't, it, it is not important whether there is 32, 33, 35 chapters or six clusters. The most important part of the negotiation process is the rule of law and everything depends on the rule of law. And uh, Montenegro has no progress regarding the rule of law. So uh, the, the basic thing is the same as, the, as, as uh, with the, uh, let's say, old methodology. So it's good that Montenegro accepted the, the methodology, but as I said, Montenegro is not successful in providing track record and the results in the rule of law. Thank you very much. Fala Puno, <laughs> Joanna, and hope to see you in Paris. Bye. 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 Thank you.